start button. button. Um, it is really a big honor for us and a pleasure to have Isabella Lava at this session with us. Um, unfortunately, I never met her personally, though I have met her earlier in other tasks. And I admire her work a lot. Isabella is at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where recently uh, two ex-students of mine started working. And she will talk to us about tiling the integers with translates of one tile. The rest I leave for you, Isabella. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, speak about this here. Uh, everything in this talk is going to be uh, joint work with Itai Lampner. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, tiling uh, integers. Uh, and uh, let me start with a quick introduction uh, to the problem. Uh, so. Um, this is an introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, the question that we are uh, looking at is the following. Uh, let's say that we have a finite set of integers. Uh, we're going to say that that set uh, tiles the integers by translations if uh, the integers can be covered by a union of disjoint translates of that set. Uh, so here are a couple of examples. Uh, if you take, let's say, the set uh, 0, 2, uh, then you just put a second copy of that set next to it, that's 1, 3, and then you repeat the pattern and you get the time. Uh, if you take, uh, say, 0, 4, 8, uh, you can do the same. Um, if you take, uh, let's say, 0, 1, 3, then that set does not tile the integers because th there is no way to close uh, the gap at two. Uh, so uh, we are going to be interested in uh, determining whether a set uh, tiles the integers. So that's a basic uh, simple looking question. Uh, there are a couple of reductions that have been known uh, for a long time. So for example, uh, Newman proved uh, in 1977 that all uh, tilings of the integer by a finite set uh, have to be periodic. Uh, that's a fairly simple pigeonholing argument. And this reduces the problem uh, to tilings of finite uh, cyclic groups with addition mod n. So uh, that's a setting that we are actually going to work in. Uh, another reduction is that we may assume uh, that the uh, period of the tiling, that's n, uh, has the same the prime factors as the cardinality of A. Uh, this is a reduction based on a theorem of uh, Tidemann, uh, but actually the first time it appeared explicitly was in uh, a paper by uh, Coven and Mayer, which, and I'm gonna have a lot more to say about that uh, later on. And uh, another reduction is that, uh, let's say that you're in the cyclic group setting, uh, you have a tiling of the uh, cyclic groups at n. And uh, then a criterion for that uh, due to sense is that uh, this is a tiling if and only if the cardinalities uh, are correct. And also uh, the sets of divisors of A and B are disjoint. Uh, by divisors, I mean uh, the numbers uh, take A and A prime uh, from A. Uh, take the difference and then take the greatest uh, common divisor with them. Uh, so uh, that has been known for a while. Uh, something else that I want to mention because uh, we are also going to use it is that we can represent uh, integer tilings as multidimensional uh, tilings of lattices. Uh, so let's say that we have a tiling of that n. Uh, we uh, write n as a, a product of powers of distinct primes. And then uh, by the uh, Chinese remainder theorem, we can uh, represent that m as a, a direct sum of the corresponding 
uh, groups uh, corresponding to the parents of these big kinds. And that looks like a k-dimensional lattice, and so we basically have a lattice diagram. Uh, I, I want to mention two things related to this. One is that this is a, not more than just a multidimensional tiling because it's going to be important that you have different plants in different directions. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I've seen some very interesting uh, discussions of whether the Chinese remainder theorem should actually be named after a specific Chinese person, and if so, then how to um, spell the name of that person in English. And so if anybody here is better informed about that than I am, then I would be very interested to, to hear from you about it. Okay. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, the A set is um, represented in red. The, these are the uh, lattice tilings that I talked about. The B set is uh, blue, and the, the green point, point belongs to uh, both sets in the given time. Uh, so we start with a very basic example uh, where uh, A is a lattice on one scale, and B is a lattice on uh, a lower scale. And you, you can basically think about it as a, a tiling of a plane but by a, a rectangle. Uh, in the second example, uh, let's see, uh, the, the one on the, the right uh, from the lattice, this one, uh, it, it's again a lattice type example, except uh, this time the, I, I mixed up the scale, so uh, low in one direction, high in, in the other direction, that sort of thing. And then uh, we started trying to mess up those tilings and produce uh, tilings that are less regular and less lattice-like. And so we came up with those here below. And something that we noticed is that uh, the more we try to mess up uh, one of the tilings, the more regular uh, the other one has to be. And uh, that's... Uh, going to be a recurring uh, theme in our work. So I just want to point this out. All right, so uh, let me talk about the common layer which tiling conditions. Uh, these are con conditions that uh, might or might not characterize all finite tiles and uh, in general, this is still open, but I want to talk about some progress that we have made on that. Uh, first of all, we need to reformulate the uh, timing problem in terms of polynomials. Uh, I'm going to assume that A and B are uh, sets of non-negative integers. We can also assume by translational invariance that zero belongs uh, to both of them. And then we define polynomials uh, A of X and B of X. A of x is the sum of x to the a, where a runs over the elements of a, and likewise uh, for b. And then uh, the tiling condition is equivalent to saying that the product a of x, b of x, is equal to uh, 1 plus x, uh, and so on, plus x to the n minus 1, uh, mod uh, x to the n minus 1. And uh, now we are going to try to uh, factorize that. So uh, that brings us to cyclotomic polynomials. Uh, these are the irreducible factors of x to the n minus 1. Uh, if you uh, split that up into non-irreducible factors, uh, you get uh, the phi s polynomials, one for each divisor of n, uh, including 1 and n. And then uh, the timing condition is equivalent to saying that uh, the uh, cardinalities of A and B are correct. And also that each of these cyclotomic factors divides um, A of X times B of X for all S uh, dividing N and different from one. And uh, because the phi S are irreducible, each of those uh, has to uh, divide at least one of a of x and b of x. Right. So uh, 
uh, this is the theorem that uh, Colin and Mayanich wrote. Uh, let's uh, define SA to be uh, the set of all uh, prime powers uh, so that phi uh, t to the alpha divides A. And then we consider the following condition. Uh, one is that A of one is the product of phi S of one with S in SA. And uh, T2 says that if uh, S1 to SK are powers of uh, different primes, then uh, the mixed superatomic phi S1 to SK uh, divides A of X. Then if A satisfies these two conditions, then it tiles the integers. If it tiles the integers, it satisfies the first condition. And uh, if A tiles, and if the cardinality of A has at most two prime factors, then uh, T2 has the whole. Uh, T1 is a fairly simple counting condition. The T2 is a much deeper condition that uh, uh, basically describes the structure uh, of A in ways that are still difficult to understand. But let me show you a geometric way to understand that condition. Uh, so uh, assume that A uh, plus B is a tiling. Uh, we are interested in figuring out whether A satisfies T2. And it uh, turns out that this is true if and only if the B set in the tiling uh, can be replaced by something called a standard uh, tiling set. And that's a very regular set uh, like one of those uh, lattices that I showed you earlier. In three dimensions, you would have something like that, but, but uh, three dimension. Uh, so uh, given the prime power and cyclotomics that uh, divide uh, A and B, uh, that determines uniquely the standard time set. Uh, this was already implicit in uh, the common mayor which paper. Uh, they used uh, that set as uh, the tiling complement as uh, assuming that, that uh, A satisfies T1 and T2. Uh, so if you look at it a little bit more carefully, this actually turns out to be an equivalence. Uh, because this is a harmonic analysis section, yeah. I want to uh, explain one reason why this is related to analysis, that there's a conjecture Beautiful Gladys from 1974, which says that a subset of Rn uh, tiles Rn by translations. Uh, if and only if um, the L2 space um, on that set admits an uh, orthogonal basis of exponentials. Uh, this is known to be false in general. The first country example was due to Tau, and then uh, there were uh, further examples due to other people. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there are important connections between tiling and spectrality. So, for example, it's true for convex sets uh, in uh, Rn. So, uh, that's due to Yasevich cuts and tau in two dimensions, and more recently uh, to Greenfield and Lev in three dimensions, and then Lev and Matalchi in general. Uh, there's also a lot of recent work on uh, Fugladis conjecture for uh, finite groups. And the connection uh, between that and T2 is uh, something that I worked on uh, 20 years ago. And specifically, the T2 condition implies spectrality in uh, the corresponding setting. Uh, I did it for unions of finitely many unit intervals in R, uh, but the same is true in the finite uh, group setting with uh, the same proof. Uh, the main result that I want to uh, talk about, and this is a uh, joint work with Itai Lombner, uh, is that uh, we can prove T2 uh, when M, the timing period is uh, E1, P2, P3 uh, squared. Uh, this is the simplest case that cannot be reduced to two prime factors using uh, methods that uh, have been known previously. Uh, we uh, also need to assume that uh, the primes uh, have to be different from two, but it's likely that this 
can be dropped with additional work. And uh, in that setting, we can prove that A and B both in satisfy T2. Uh, a couple of comments. One is that the proof also provides essentially a classification of all uh, kinds of that period. Uh, and also, uh, see that the bad news is that even this was very difficult to prove, and uh, it's a content of to fairly long papers that might not be easy to read. Uh, the uh, good news is that uh, now that we have those methods, um, they are likely to extend uh, to uh, more general versions of the question. Uh, in fact, some of our intermediate results are uh, already valid under more general assumptions. Uh, so uh, it's likely that uh, uh, this uh, uh, is uh, going to lead to further results. Uh, I want to uh, say a little bit about why three prime factors are uh, more difficult. Uh, if uh, the timing period has only two prime factors or two, two dis distinct prime factors, then uh, it's well known that at least one of the sets A and B has to be uh, contained in a proper subgroup. Uh, that's a result uh, due to sense. Uh, <laughs> can, can I see that cut? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a good surprise. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, once you know that one of the sets has to uh, be contained in a subgroup, that you can um, use that to start an inductive argument, and that's actually what Kevin and Mayer did. Uh, for uh, three prime factors, uh, this is not true. Uh, there are country examples due to Sabo, and so um, we uh, have to figure out uh, how to uh, solve the problem without using that inductive argument. Uh, let me show you a couple of ingredients uh, of the proof. So uh, I'm going to start with the uh, box product. Uh, if uh, little m is a divisor of the big M, and x is a, a point in Zn. Uh, I'm going to define a quantity called a uh, m, sub m of x, and uh, this is going to be the number of uh, elements of a, uh, such that the greatest common divisor of x minus a with uh, the big M is the little m. And then uh, I'm going to define a, a box product, which is basically a weighted sum uh, of um, those uh, of products of those quantities uh, for A and B. Uh, if you uh, represent the A uh, M, M quantities as a, a multidimensional matrix, uh, three dimensional in the case of three time factors, uh, then you can think about that as an inner product of uh, those matrices. A, a characterization of tiling. Uh, that uh, is related to that is that uh, A plus B is a tiling of that M if and only if the cardinalities of uh, A and B are correct. And additionally, uh, the box product of uh, each of those boxes uh, or each pair of those boxes is one. Uh, so we, we actually had a weaker uh, version of that in an unpublished paper with uh, Gangel and Wen. Uh, what we uh, did in uh, the current uh, papers is, first of all, we uh, stated uh, the theorem in, in uh, this form, which was not uh, available before. And uh, also, we found uh, better ways to use it. So we can do that more effectively now. And uh, one way that we are going to use the box product is to uh, define something we call saturated sets. 
Uh, so uh, let's say that X is a, a point on ZM. And uh, I'm going to define AX to be the set of all A uh, in A, uh, so that um, A contributes to the box products uh, with uh, B and B. Um, in uh, other words, uh, the greatest common divisor of uh, X minus A with N uh, has to be uh, a divisor in B. Uh, if X itself is an element of A, then uh, this is basically trivial because uh, in that case, uh, AX uh, has to be uh, just the single one consisting of X. Uh, that's uh, the trivial case and this follows by a divisor exclusion. Uh, the case when X is not in A uh, turns out to be much more interesting. Uh, because we uh, still have divisor exclusion, and that still leads to geometric restriction, uh, restrictions on uh, where A of X might be located. Uh, but now this tells us something about the elements of A that we did not know before. Uh, so uh, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that I have two points of A, that's the red ones here, uh, placed as in uh, the picture at the bottom of the slide with, with difference m over pi uh, between. And uh, suppose that x, that's another point here uh, on the same line, also with the difference m, m over pi, uh, does not belong to A. And uh, let's consider uh, the situating set for x. Uh, by the geometric restrictions that follow from divisor exclusion, uh, I can say that uh, the, the saturating set has to be contained in uh, the plane at the bottom. And that tells me a couple of things. For example, that uh, that plane has to contain some elements of A somewhere. And uh, also relative to uh, the divisor. Here, uh, I get some estimate from below on how many elements of A I need to have. Okay, so uh, this is what we are going to use to uh, try to uh, reduce tilings to something that we can work with. Uh, one more uh, thing that I want to introduce is fibering. Uh, a fiber at the top scale is basically an arithmetic progression in uh, one of the cardinal directions of uh, maximal length with a difference m over, uh, let's say, pj. And uh, a, a fiber on a lower scale is sort of the same, except you first have to uh, collapse uh, to that lower scale, and then you see the fiber. Thank you. Uh, did someone have a question? Hmm? Okay, so uh, the outline of the proof looks something like this. Uh, Let's say that M is uh, PI, PJ, PK squared. A and B both have cardinalities PI, PJ, PK. So that's, again, the simplest case that you cannot reduce to two prime factors. And uh, phi M has to divide uh, one of the sets A and B. So let's say that it divides A. Uh, one possibility is that A um, is uh, not fibered on uh, a, a grid on the top scale, uh, meaning that it's not a union of uh, progressions uh, like this all in the same directions. Uh, that, in that case, we can basically classify the structures that uh, A has to have uh, on uh, a grid like that. It has to be one, one of um, several uh, types of structures, we, we can 
we, we had a whole classification of them. We uh, gave them pet names and everything. So here, here are a couple of examples. And uh, so now you, you have to look at two cases. Uh, well, one is you, you have one of uh, the structures from the last slide, and the other the case is that you, you do have uh, fiber grids, and then you try to go down uh, to, to a lower scale. Uh, if every grid was uh, fiber in the same direction, then there would be a very simple inductive argument that you could use. Uh, Unfortunately, it's also possible for different grids to be fiber in different directions. And, and uh, so um, that's like um, uh, 25 pages of pretty ha uh, heavy duty mathematics. Um, for uh, the special structures, we use saturating sets and uh, something we call fiber shifting to reconstruct the rest of the terms. And uh, the goal is to try to reduce to the case when uh, one of the sets is the standard tiling complement, and at that point, uh, we are done. Uh, so here's an example how we do it. Let's start with the uh, structure that uh, I mentioned earlier. So this is something called the full plane. Um, you, you have a fiber, and then you have a bunch of points in, in the plane uh, at the bottom. So uh, if you uh, use uh, saturating sets, then uh, you get that uh, the uh, products A of a AX and B of B uh, could be saturated in only uh, one of two possible ways. One is you have a fiber in A here and then a corresponding fiber in B on a lower scale, or else you had the same uh, in the other direction. Uh, at this point, we don't know that we don't actually have both of those uh, for different elements uh, B and B, uh, but uh, turns out that, uh, that there's a counting argument uh, that eliminates one of those possibilities. So actually, you uh, you can only have a fiber in one of those directions. And then you also get a stronger statement about B, uh, which is that it has to be fibered uh, on a lower scale, uh, all of them. Uh, then uh, you can do something called a fiber shift. Uh, so uh, this is something that we can uh, prove is a valid operation on tiling sets. You take the, the fiber that you had off the grid and you put it in place. Uh, and the, the new set A uh, again tiles uh, ZN with the same tiling component. Uh, now we consider saturating sets at the uh, points that uh, I now indicated, and then you will keep repeating uh, the procedure uh, until uh, you get the standard set, and that uh, implies T2 for both sets. Uh, let me show something here on video. Uh, so uh, you can think about uh, tiling with a standard A and standard B as a tiling of a, a cube, big cube using small cubes. Uh, the sabotide examples that I mentioned earlier are obtained by uh, shifting uh, some of the columns oh. here. Uh, so that uh, I, I didn't shift it by the entire cube length, just, just part of the way. And uh, you do that in each direction. So what we do here is uh, sort of the uh, reverse of that. Uh, we start with a partial tiling where I'm only looking at one grid. So I, I don't know that, that those columns have been shifted. And then using saturating sets, I, I can uh, prove that uh, this actually, first of all, had to be here. And second, that I can shift it back in place and uh, do that 
uh, for all the missing columns, and then I, I have a nice regular lattice styling, and I know everything about it. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Isabella, for a beautiful talk. Um, are there questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions to Isabella. Can so, I ask you one thing, Isabella? Mm -hmm. um, at, at the beginning of your talk, you were you were when you were talking about the two tiles and that as one tile gets more disorganized, the other one has to organize. Is there some uncertainty principle behind this? Or I mean, or is this just a... Uh, it would be very nice if we could prove that. Mm -hmm. I suspect <laughs> that there is something like that, but, but right now we are still at a stage where, where we don't know how to prove very basic things. So. Yeah, I think that there should be some sort of uncertainty principle like that. And that model, you build it yourself? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no that, that, that's magnetic cubes it's from a toy store. Magnetic cubes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, some more questions. Otherwise, we thank Isabella again. Okay, let's thank Isabella again. Lucas, you can stop recording. <laughs>